screen? Yes, I can see. All right, great. All right, cool. So first of all, thanks a lot for the invitation. I know that this is the, the, the first seminar uh, of this, you know, early career insights. So when, when I got your email, um, I thought a little bit about it because it's, it's, it's not a classic talk, right? It's not like, okay, I, I will present you my research, et cetera, et cetera. So, it is, it's, so, so I thought about it. What, what could I give as an insight to early career um, researchers? And I thought, uh, how about just telling them what I did from uh, for my career and, uh, you know, uh, do that instead. So uh, let me reintroduce myself. So I'm Dimitris Kanoulas. I'm, I'm associate professor uh, at UCL, the computer science department. And in the same time, I'm a UKRI future leaders fellow. This was round five. So I started a year ago, uh, uh, my fellowship. Um, so, so what is this fellowship? Let's start, let's start this. So this fellowship, it's one of the most prestigious uh, fellowships uh, in our country, in, in the UK. Uh, and I got almost one and a half million uh, for um, four years to work on an exciting project for me, which is um, the perception for electro robot locomotion in roughly uncertain terrains. And, um, and today I will explain to you uh, how I managed to reach uh, this uh, stage. Uh, before I start, uh, I have my, this is my favorite quote from, from Feynman. And it says that you have no responsibility to live up to what other people think you ought to accomplish. I have no responsibility to be like they expect me to be. It's their mistake, not my failing. All right. So this is my favorite quote because it's, it's in the end of the story, it's not about what other people think about you. It's about what you like to do and what you are excited about. And I will prove it to you today from decisions I made uh, during my, um, uh, my academic uh, career. Um, also, uh, I'm not here to give instructions of what to do. Uh, it is just to tell you what I did uh, from, uh, since I, I started uh, my um, academic uh, career. So, um, first of all, uh, I was born in a, in a nice village uh, in uh, North Greece. Uh, my village is called Epanomi uh, in 1985. And I spent the first 17 years uh, there. Um, uh, so I did my school there. And what I remember, I don't remember too many things from back then. But uh, in terms of, of science, but what I remember is that I was interested in, in, in two uh, fields. Uh, I was super interested in biology. Somehow I liked, I liked biology a lot. And at the same time, I liked uh, a lot computer science. Uh, I don't know if you know this movie. Uh, this movie is like, probably is a retro now. It's, uh, it's, it's called Hackers and you, you can see Angelina Jolie there. Uh, now, if you if you watch this movie, is, is you may laugh, but uh, back then it was super exciting. You know, like these hackers going around the city. Um, so when I had to decide what direction to go, um, I could not decide. But uh, I thought that I did like a lot of coding when I was in high school, and this was back in two thousands. Okay, so. Um, I decided to, to pick one of the areas that I thought is exciting, and that was uh, computer science. So for my university, I traveled south um, in, a, in, in a town called Patras uh, to do my, uh, my diploma. This is a five years program uh, in the engineering department, in the engineering faculty um, uh, for, for the next five years, basically. I have to tell you that that was a, a pretty difficult uh, program in general. So I had to take around 60 modules uh, and I had the six months diploma thesis in the end of, in the end of my, of my um, diploma uh, to be able to, to graduate. Um, and uh, on the, uh, the fourth year, we had to decide which direction we should go. 
So there were three directions uh, in, in my department. One was hardware and computer arch architecture, which was a very nice um, direction for people that they want to do, uh, you know, hands-on. Um, they wanted the job in hands-on uh, engineering. Uh, this included robotics, this included um, networks, microcontrollers, you know, all these, all these exciting things. There was a direction called software engineering, which was very interesting. This was more coding, more software development, more uh, paradigms for uh, good coding uh, and so on. And then there was the least popular one, which was foundations of computer science. This was super theoretical. It, it had probabilities, it had, um, um, you know, uh, math, uh, statistics, like a lot of these things. And I thought about it for a bit and I thought, I should go with that, what I like and not what it will give me a good job, right? And I picked <laughs> the least favorite uh, for most of the students. So I picked the foundations of computer science uh, direction, which gave me a very good base uh, on, on mathematical concepts uh, and computer science concepts uh, at that time. When I was fifth year, there was a person, uh, a professor, uh, that taught a very exciting course. And that course was called Algorithmic Game Theory. I, I don't know if you have seen uh, the, the movie Beautiful Mind uh, about Nas, uh, John Nas. Uh, it's a nice movie. Um, so he taught this course. And I thought that from the first lecture, I thought that that's it. That is what I want to do in my life. Uh, and. Uh, and then I selected to do my final project with Paul Spirakis, Professor Paul Spirakis on algorithm game theory. A second person came into, into this game, uh, Dr. Uh, Haralabos Chaknakis, uh, who, who was a collaborator at that time with uh, Paul Spirakis. And we defined a very hard pro problem in game theory, which is approximate Nash equilibrium. Uh, I worked for roughly one year on this problem as a bachelor student. That was the most productive and nice period of my life. Also very stressful. Uh, I, I remember staying awake, awake all night. And then in the morning, I had phone calls from uh, Dr. Chaknakis uh, and meetings with uh, Paul Sviragis. And um, I worked really hard, really, really hard. And what we managed to do was to uh, to find and evaluate the best uh, approximation to of Nas equilibrium in non-cooperative bimatrix games, uh, and believe it or not, uh, nobody has beaten us since then. So we still hold the best approximation uh, since 2008. And uh, I managed to write uh, my first paper as a bachelor student. Uh, it's a Wine 2008 paper uh, on on this topic. So when I graduated from, from my, my diploma, from my bachelor's, um, I moved to another uh, town next to the sea. So I, I keep going, I keep going to, to towns that, that, that are next to the sea. Um, and this town is called Boston in the United States. Uh, and I, I joined the Northeastern University uh, Computer Science Department um, and two brilliant, uh, uh, and I started working with two brilliant professors there, uh, Raj Rajaraman and Ravi Sundaram. So uh, these uh, two uh, professors had an, an interesting problem to solve, and uh, it was an application of game theory. Uh, it's called capacity self selfish replication games. So I will not explain more, but it's it's you can think about it as a problem where you have multiple users that they are sharing movies but they cannot store all the movies in their space. And the question is, if they have a fee to store movies, are, is there going to be an equilibrium of which movies to, to share so that nobody wants to deviate? Anyhow, I spent a couple of years on this problem, uh, and uh, we managed to publish a very nice paper. It's, a, I think, a 40 pages long paper um, called Cast Me If You Can. Uh, and uh, that was a very exciting project, but uh, when we solved this, so, so when we proved some NP completeness, uh, it was kind of over. So I had 
to select something completely different, uh, not completely different, but in a different, in a different, um, you know, application, game theory in different application. Um, and uh, it was the time that I was thinking about what to do. And then uh, this person came into my life. Uh, so Marty Vona was a PhD student at MIT, uh, working with Daniela Rus as a supervisor. Um, and because in Boston, uh, the community is very, very nice. So um, I haven't seen that in London, but maybe I'm wrong. So, you know, like when you are in one university, you can visit other universities to to attend seminars, to attend courses. So I, I was going very often to Harvard and MIT for seminars. And uh, I visited this lab and I learned that um, uh, Marty uh, is going to join our department as a professor uh, at this exact period. And I talked with him during a seminar and a meeting after that. And he explained to me what he wanted to solve uh, as a general concept. And what he wanted to solve, you can see here. So he wanted to make bipedal robots locomote in in very rocky terrains. And I found this super exciting. Uh, so in 2011, between 2011 and 2012, I completely switched its topics. So from a very theoretical person that I was doing theory proof, theory proof, lemma proof, lemma proof, <laughs> I decided to switch completely areas and go towards robotics. Uh, the switch did not seem too dramatic to me at that point because the original plan was to work on theoretical parts. So um, think that uh, uh, topics that um, Laval, Stephen Laval is working on, you know, he had also a game theoretic, uh, if you have read his book, he has a, a game theory chapter as well. So I thought that, all right, so it is like, it's, it's kind of an application of what I'm doing. This is what I thought back then. Uh, so it didn't seem too dramatic, but the, the truth is that I started from scratch. I started from scratch reading um, with my advisors, um, you know, supervision, whole books uh, every week, every week, and uh, I, and <laughs> it, it was very funny because I I, I do remember this period, uh, and uh, I, I was finding mistakes in these books, and I was sending them to the authors. And uh, now I, I should be in, in around five, six books, uh, errata uh, pages, uh, where I, I, I notify them of a, of a typo that they did in page 250. I don't know. Um, nevertheless, um, I worked a lot on this problem. Uh, this was an exciting problem. So we wanted to figure out how a robot, a humanoid robot, should um, use the environment, should use the, the perception of the environment and step on on rocky surfaces so we, we we took inspiration by from humans and we and I, this is my phd thesis so we thought that uh what we need to do is to to sparsify the footholds and find sparse sets of footholds for 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 walking and what i ended up doing was a system uh which is which is more like a slum system um and locomotion system let's say, but based on, on higher level of, of um, meaningful areas in the area uh, called patches. So um, a, a, a simultaneously and tracking and, and, and mapping patches in the area uh, for locomotion. And we managed to 3D print this really nice uh, small robot in the lab um, to do some, you know, um, stepping on rocks. Note that uh, a lot of developments that you have seen in the area were, were not there. So Atlas was not super stable back then. It was not using any kind of vision. Uh, so that was somehow uh, super exciting uh, back then, back in 2014, all right? Uh, and earlier. So I started I started doing that in 2010 almost. So that, that was pretty much my PhD and, and I, I did really like it. But of course, that was a, a toy robot, right? So that was that was something that it was small. Locomotion was not super super challenging. I mean, we, we did some you know quasi static uh, um, stepping, and 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 that was it. So 
when I finished, I decided to return back to Europe and uh, I found another nice city <laughs> next, next to the beach, uh, which is called Genoa in Italy. Uh, and I joined the Italian Institute of Technology there. And uh, I was super lucky to work with two really, really nice people there. So uh, Nikos Tsagarax and Darwin Caldwell, um, who accepted me uh, in the department to work on the perception part of their humanoid robots. Um, notice that this is a this was a megatronics department that I joined, and that was another another decision I had to take. Uh, uh, I thought that me going again to a computer science department, I will not gain much. So I thought, okay, I should go to to something completely different so that I can learn a little bit more about robotics rather than my narrow field that I gained during my PhD. And indeed, I mean, I had the luck to work with several nice robots. Uh, when I went there, uh, I started working with this little one, which is called Common. And later on, uh, I was lucky to see the full development from motors to full robot uh, and control and perception system of this nice robot called uh, Walkman, uh, which was a TIAT. And uh, I, I had the luck to work on this. Uh, later on, um, I was lucky enough to work on, a, on an animaloid robot called Centauro. Maybe you have seen it. Um, again, at IIT, this is a very powerful robot. And um, uh, we were using uh, uh, their sensory system to do some nice path planning and manipulation tasks. And last but not least, before I leave IIT, I was happy to work on a, on a, on a new version of Walkman. Internally, we will call it uh, Walkman 2, but uh, I think everybody knows it as, as Pokemon. Um, a, a, a little bit uh, um, lighter uh, version of Walkman. Um, and, and again, I, I, was, I was just in the beginning of the development of this robot. So uh, I think the project was continued after I left. All right, so the first thing that I did when I went to IIT was to work heavily on on the robotics, on the DARPA Robotics Challenge in 2015. Now there, there was a newest one uh, last year, uh, but that was the original one for humanoid robots. And it was very challenging one. So we had the team of, I don't know how many people, like 20, 30 people there, everybody working on different parts uh, of, the, of, the, of the robot. And I'm super happy because in just a few months, we will be able to, to perform tasks like what you see in these videos, so, you know, using the hose, um, walking into, into some kind of terrain, um, doing visual inspection and uh, teleoperation with our robot in real destroyed buildings after earth earthquakes and so on and so forth. So I really spent one or two years on, on, on this, you know, this competition, uh, sacrificing a lot of, um, publication opportunities, I would say. So I, I stopped publishing a little bit for, for a year. Um, but that was good because then I started publishing like crazy. So during my postdoc of five years, I published almost 40 to 50 papers in, in top journals and, and conferences. And uh, I think that, that was a, a, um, an outcome of, of the dedication I had for one year on this robot. So I knew exactly what this robot is able to do what we could do uh, about it. So I will, I will show you a little bit of, of, uh, of my results there um, uh, during, the, during the development of, 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 of my, my research, my development on, on these robots. So the first thing I thought of, of trying uh, was to take whatever I was doing at, uh, at Northeastern in my PhD and put it on, on actual robots, like on, on big robots, large scale robots. And that was not an easy thing, to be fair. I thought it would be easier, but these robots are very dynamic. The particular robots have um, series elastic actuators. So they're very, somehow very noisy uh, in terms of, of, of in the locomotion. Um, uh, part and it took some time to 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 take these approaches that I developed at uh, at uh, in my in my uh, PhD 
further introduce some, some theoretical aspects of it and allow a robot like Coman or Walkman use their purely their visual system to be able to step on rocks in such a way, like somewhere that you don't have full contact with the environment. I th haven't seen much of this happening in our community in humanoid robots, but that was super exciting. And we, we won the best paper award in humanoids 2017 in, in, um, in um, I believe that was, Ber was Birmingham. It could be, uh, it must be Birmingham. It was in the UK. Um, later on, I started working with uh, a PhD student of mine, uh, Vignas, on the path planning part of this nice robot. So this nice robot has wheels and he has legs. Uh, maybe you have seen animal uh, with in the same formation, wheels and legs. Uh, so what we wanted to do back then was to, to use simultaneously the wheels and the legs formation to be able to navigate um, uh, difficult environments. And what you see here is a purely automated way, a path planning way, I would say, uh, to do that uh, um, in real time. So uh, the robot is able to, to plan uh, the coordination of, of wheels and legs in order to cross terrains that probably would not be possible to do it uh, without this without this plan. So now you see that it opens the, the, the front legs to pass the first obstacle. It narrows the front legs while it is extending the back uh, legs and so on and so forth. That was a very exciting project and on a completely new robot. Uh, of course, we worked on other, I worked a lot on other aspects such as state estimation. Uh, I, I've seen some names here from Oxford in this call. Uh, you know, we we, are, we have worked on the on the state estimation part called Cero, um, and we have tried it on several robots, uh, uh, Centauro, Walkman, more recently on Talos. Uh, sorry, this was Iros 2022, um, and of course visual uh, visual um, um, slam uh, with this robot. So that that was another exciting area. And I'm happy because this, this is an outcome of collaboration with external people to IIT, to, to, to the place I was, I was working on. So this is a collaboration with, uh, with Stelios Piperakis in Greece, basically. And, and it's very beautifully uh, implemented on, on all our robots. Uh, similarly, we worked a lot on, on, on terrain segmentation and property estimation using our, our leg robots. I'm not going to go into details, but that was the time that deep learning start, started coming into our community. Uh, so around 2015, 16. So we, we start working on this on this end-to-end -end networks for, um, for uh, property estimation. So here you, you see that we were able to estimate on real time the type of the property and the roughness just using the RGB uh images and on in this video you you don't see but we use the force torque sensors on the foot to understand mechanical properties of the ground while you are walking on them of course locomotion was one part and was uh, directly related to my phd but I, uh, but i thought that since i'm there and since i'm using humanoid robots that they have arms it would be nice to work on manipulation as well so I started working on manipulation on things that I found very interesting. For example, a problem that I figured out during the DARPA challenge is that when robots were grasping heavy objects, they were doing it very wrong, um, in a wrong way. So they, they were grasping from the very edge. And uh, of course, this was uh, there, there was an issue with breaking motors or, uh, or you know, dropping the, the debris. Just to tell you that DARPA uh, changed the task by removing uh, heavy wood and replacing them with very light to deal with this problem. So they, they didn't deal with it, they just changed the problem basically. So what we tried on, on Walkman was to use visual and force torque sensing to understand where exactly we need to grasp uh, an object in order to minimize um, uh, torque into the on the motors. Okay, and again, as I said, uh, uh deep learning came into the into the uh, into our community back in 2015 uh 14 15 so uh with a student of mine back there back then and we we start working on um an end-to-end -end 
network, deep, deep learning method, network, uh, in order to identify object affordances and try to do some grasping, some pooling, uh, this kind of tasks uh, for uh, for the Walkman robot. Okay. Uh, another exciting part that I wanted to explore was human robot uh, collaboration interaction. Uh, so here you see one of our bachelor students from um, Plymouth uh, that visited IIT uh, to use open um, uh, open pose uh, in order to control in a whole body a notion the full robot. So you see that the full robot is uh, able to uh, to balance and uh, and uh, perform the tasks that imitate basically the human um, in a, a, in a full body uh, control way using uh, the open shot system of Enrico Hoffman. Um, so you see that we're able to grasp objects by manual manipulation. We're able to to perform really nice tasks. So that was another interesting um, uh, direction that I want to explore. So in, in other words, I want to explore locomotion, manipulation, and human-robot interaction. That, that was the main purpose of my work as a, as a postdoc. As I said, I published roughly 40 to 50 papers uh, back then, uh, some of them first authored, some of them with collaboration, some of them with supervision. Um, some of them internally, some of them with external collaborators. So I tried all possible ways uh, to explore and to, uh, to to explore the field of humanoid robots, of animaloid robots. Uh, of course, always from a perception and path planning point of view, I would say. And then I came to uh, in 2019, a, a little bit before COVID. Uh, I came uh, in, in the UK and I joined uh, UCL as a lecturer originally and recently as associate professor. And I start thinking about the problem from scratch. So I start thinking of what is really missing. I mean, you, you, you see all these nice robots, but, but the reality is not always what you see there. So you see a lot of failures. You see a lot of, a lot of, a lot of scenarios that, that are not ideal and in the same time you see nature doing so well uh most of the cases of course we are failing as well but but not as often as like robots especially humanoids all right uh, and um i start thinking of what what is missing and and from my point of view what is missing is really understanding the environment the surrounding environment around uh, around these robots. So the, the other thing I start thinking is that somehow uh, when I was a postdoc and when I was a PhD student, I, I didn't really think about applications of my of my techniques, right? So maybe I didn't care. I, I don't I don't I don't recall why we were always under a European project or a SF project like H20 or NSFN. We were all like we were just doing research, right? Okay. Okay. Can we make this robot uh, walk? Yeah, okay, let's do that. Can we make this robot uh, jump? Okay, let's do that. But when I came here, I started thinking of you know what is the real application. So we, we, we and I, what I thought is that what I would like our robots to do is to go to some environments that humans are not able to go. Either they're very dangerous, they're very hazardous. Um, some volcanoes, some nuclear plants, some construction buildings, uh, even in different plan planets, right? So like like Mars. All right. So I start rethinking a little bit about about the problem, and a different thing that I start thinking about when I joined UCL was that my knowledge on the perception part and path planning part of robots. It's not enough to understand the full the full problem. So I start exploring also myself, of course, with the help of my PhD students, other aspects of robotics, which is the design and control and you know trajectory planning and other things uh, like you know meta learning, right? So all all these concepts that um, I, I was a bit away before, at least I understood that I should have a basic understanding of this 
to be able to move forward, right? And that's what I did. So starting from uh, starting from um, even from design, we, we collaborate with the mechanical engineering department, so uh, Helge would demand at UCL uh, to start designing some new uh, grippers. So this is the first prototype. The second prototype looks much neater, I would say. But uh, this is to, to grasp uh, large objects uh, in, a, in a nice way. Um, and we start developing the hardware of this, the sensory system, and of course, starting using learning techniques to, to do grasping there. Uh, I, start, I start thinking about unsupervised learning and self-supervised learning with uh, another PhD student of mine, uh, Dennis. Um, and and that, was, that is also an exciting area that I'm, I'm considering, something that beforehand I was not doing. I was collecting data and labeling them and doing end-to-end -end learning. Uh, I think now this is dying. Um, so uh, I think that's another exciting area. So you can see here that, you know, we're able to, we, without any, any, any sort of, learning um sorry any sort of labeling we are able to 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 associate grasps with uh, uh, for different objects that are unseen to the to the robot okay i start thinking a little bit more about how we do teleoperation so this is a project with uh, leeds university of leeds with cheng shu zhao um called um teleman uh, and, and here you see some demos of, of us using some nice body suits, IMU body suits, some VR to be able to, to, to you know, to use a, a legged manipulator and uh, perform some tasks. Uh, I'm sure you have seen the burger making uh, from, from, from Cheng Shu's uh, lab. I mean, that, that was an exciting project. And it is when I, I started understanding a little bit more teleoperation uh, in, in this uh, in this area and of course i start looking to different problems than other people for example uh, the namo problem navigation of movable obstacles problem where the robot really needs to push around objects to make space to free space in order to um uh, to go from one place to the other instead of just avoiding obstacles so here you see a work that we did with with a research assistant in my in my lab, where our Go One robot uh, is able to uh, learn uh, using reinforcement learning a way to push around uh, boxes in order to free space and walk through uh, through a narrow narrow space. Yeah, I hear some background noise. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay. Yeah. Um, Again, I, I keep I keep working with people external to UCL on meaningful problems for me. So garbage recycling, for example, this work is with uh, IIT in in Genova. Uh, we we develop the perception system. They develop the whole body controller for this mobile manipulator, where we give them we give them basically the the type of garbage that is in front of the of the robot and where they need to to grasp it and where to throw it. And they work on a whole body control to be able to walk around and to move around and, and collect garbage to the right the recycling bin. And of course, other projects such as uh, such as path planning problems when uh, when you have a, a newly generated and constrained environment. So here you see that we use mobile manipulation uh, in order to 3D print a structure, but in the same time we want to avoid collision. Between the structure and the and the um, and the robot, um, and uh, and this is a very challenging problem apparently. So uh, because you need to keep accuracy, but in the same time you need to plan without removing your end effector from the ground because you don't want to have gaps. So that's that's a nice project, uh, PhD actually from, from from a student of ours, uh, Julie, um, and this brought me to, 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 to this idea of rethinking a little bit about robot locomotion, an idea that developed from my PhD time 
and later on and propose this system, the, the, this idea to UKRI and gaining um, one and a half million to, to work on this with, with my team. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm roughly finishing my, my, my talk here, but what I want to tell you is that uh, one thing I'm proud of is that uh, I really moved, moved around uh, to different areas. So I, I didn't stick to one group. I didn't stick to even to one country. Uh, I really uh, thought that I need to gain knowledge from all over the world. So I, I really traveled uh, and worked in three, four, five countries, uh, if we include my internships also, um, on, 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 and progressing on the topic. So not being narrow, uh, or, you know, not, not working in a narrow field of, you know, the thing that I, when, when I want to do a, when I went to do a PhD, I said, okay, I'm going to do algorithm game theory and, and that's it. You know, that, that's no, no. I mean, if I don't do that, I will not do anything else. This changed. I mean, and I try to tell the same to my students as well that, you know, don't think that because you started something, you need to finish with this your life, you know, it's or your PhD. I, I did change a lot. I did change from, from, and I developed, I think, and I'm very proud. Of, I'm very proud about this. Uh, and the, the other thing I'm proud about, about what I did is that, uh, I really looked forward to work with real hardware. And this is not something that everybody was doing. Uh, no, so usually some people were, were focused on one robot and they were, or, or, or no robot at all, just simulations. Uh, but I really, I really tried in my career to work on different platforms, uh, and 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 I think the, I gained a lot of knowledge. I mean, I think because of this, I do know the real problems of of this of this uh, platform. So I know that when I'm watching the last video of Atlas, I know what exactly they did, how the, when they cheated, if they did, and when not. All right. So and and I do understand a bit more when I see spot walking. I do know when it's gonna fail. Okay, and I think this is this comes with experience with with real platforms. And, and last but not least, I think uh, it's not just my work. I mean, I collaborated with lots of people. Like I have so many authors, I don't even remember. Uh, I, I tried to be as collaborative as possible, and I think nothing, nothing, nothing would be possible uh, without people working. Um, and me working with them. Uh, I think this is important. I think for me, collaboration works as is like the number one priority. Uh, I, I I don't have. I think I have zero papers as single author. Uh, and okay, during my PhD, I had papers only with my supervisor because I was um, his first student when he joined the department. But other than that, I keep I keep collaborating with lots of people. And I, I do really enjoy um, uh, working with them. I think this is the way that robotics works. It's a very interdisciplinary topic. And uh, I think uh, it needs a lot of people to make something happen. And that's it for me. I don't know how did I, I mean, did I do in time-wise? Uh, yeah, timing minutes? is perfect. Yeah, lovely, yeah. All right. Thank you, Professor. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Canales. Um, I, I, I'm now going to open the floor to, for our audience to ask questions. But I guess our audience, it may take some time to put in the chat. So I, I really want to ask the, the first question. Um, um, you, 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 I, for those who um, who who don't know the UKRI Future Leader Fellowship is, is, is a highly prestigious um brand and also i want to say that it is a broad brand which in, in we, we, which means that um robotics and even the general robotics autonomous system is a very small area mm. being assessed in the future leader fellowship and this research area this research needs to compete 
with people doing civil engineering, with maybe mechanical engineering, doing communication engineering, a broad range of topics. Mm -hmm. So my first question is, what do you think in the research idea can convince the panel? Right. First, in, the, when they are assessing a, a, a wide range of topics. Right. First, I, you are right that, uh, you know, I, I think I'm until cohort six, I think I'm the only one doing robotics in the in the cohort. And uh, I have to tell you that, I mean, this is something like it's it's backstage information, right? So, you know, it took me one year to develop the, the, the application. OK, so it, it's not an easy process. It, 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 it takes time. It takes it takes a lot of iterations, etc. So I think the, 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 the first thing, uh, so wh what is this fellowship looking for is not, this is not the European project, it's not the EPSRC project, it's not a project, okay? Just to start with this, it's a fellowship, which means that these people, what they are assessing is that they are assessing novel ideas, okay? Something novel, all right? Uh, and they would like to know details, of course, of, of, of your plan, but they would like to know that um, this is not just, oh, I will do this and this will be the outcome. I will do this and I, this will be the outcome. It is more about, I will explore this this way. I will explore this, uh, this, um, uh, this field and I will try to make this thing. Notice that the, the fellowship gives 100% of your time, almost 100% of your time is being paid by the UKRI for this purpose. So, so you don't do much admin, you don't do much teaching, but you focus on, on you learning how to do things, right? Uh, so what they assess, they assess everything. So they assess the idea. So I think this is the base. So you need to have a good idea about what you want to work. You need to have a novel idea. And this, this idea should be um, a worldwide novel idea, right? So you, you, you need to convince them that you will be the one that uh, will bring something new in the society, in the world, in the UK and in the world. All right. The second part is that they want to see you um, becoming a leader. Okay. And this has so many, so many aspects and research is just one aspect. Okay, so they need you to, to tell them how you will manage a team, how you will make a team, how you will train your team, how you will be trained by the, by the team, how are you going to manage a team, how are you going to connect with partners, what you will give to the partners, what partners will give to you, what's going to happen in the full project, basically. Then they will need to know what is the impact. Right, so they, they will need to know, like, okay, if, if things that you say they, they do work, what's going to happen? What, what are we going to have a super novel theory in the field that is going to be revolutionary? Are we going to have a very nice application that you can make a startup later? Are you gonna what? What is the impact? Uh, is the society going to benefit? Is the research community going to benefit? Who is going to benefit? All right. So all these aspects, they, they, they take time to think about, and, and they're not very trivial, to be fair. So, I mean, at least at UCL, we, we do have people that uh, you take this into iterations, and then you ask opinion. And, you know, the iterations can be forever. <laughs> like, they, they, you, know, you can have five, 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 six iterations that, that, that with a lot of comments, and then you need to fit everything into, you know, 10 pages or something. So it takes time. And of course, you cannot explain everything in your proposal. And, and there is where reviewers are criticizing. They, they will criticize always um, everything. And this is, their, this, this is their job, right? To tell you, oh, but you didn't explain the methodology in detail. Uh, and then you tell them, okay, but I cannot fit the details there. Or they may tell you that, oh, you don't um, show impact or, and this kind of things. But basically, what you need to do is that UKRI has a checklist and they, they check everything. So they, they check impact, um, you know, finance, blah, 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 blah. And you need to go through them and make sure that your proposal uh, answers pretty much all of this. 
Then, of course, if you go through the first round and you you go to the interview phase, that's actually something completely different uh, because there you are not assessed about your project anymore. You are assessed about the reviewer's criticism, which is more difficult because, you know, maybe reviewers found a gap in your in your proposal, right? So then you need to, to convince the panel that you do know what you are talking about, that you know the solution to things, that you know what, uh, what is happening. And then, of course, the last stage is where you, you, you get the acceptance or the rejection. Um, so I, I, think, I think the process is long. Uh, and this might work also for, for smaller fellowships, like uh, postdoctoral fellowships, for instance, like uh, earlier career fellowships. Maybe not as dramatic as this, because this is a lot of money. Uh, but again, I think the process is very similar. So what, what, I, what I did and I'm not sure how people feel about this, is that, you know, I had an original idea, I had the first draft with my thoughts, and then I circulated to colleagues that I trusted. They told me my, their opinion, I integrated their opinion, and then I went to colleagues in the department that they have successful fellowships, successful proposals, and I told them, what do you think about this? And they were making comments. And then, you know, I was going always to different people for different comments. I contacted around 10, 15 people to be able to, to coordinate and write this proposal. Uh, the most difficult part, I don't know if this is true for postdocs when you do a postdoctoral fellowship, but for, for, for us, for UKRI and EPSRC, for me, the most difficult part of all is to find commitments from, um, uh, from partners mm. that, that's the most difficult because it's not it's not so you know you can spend like one week not sleeping and then you can write everything but you know if, if you ask a partner can you give me a letter of support next week it will not happen they they need months depending on how large the company is and how many panels they need to go through and you need to discuss about what kind of support you need to you need to tell them in the UK that they will not get any money. So you need to convince them that, you know, they will gain something out of this because, you know, they, they're not of, these are, these are one PI fellowships, right? So it's not, so just the PI is taking the money to spend them, but, but not partners. Uh, so it's not, a, it's not a project, as I mentioned. So it's very difficult to convince partners and find partners. Uh, for me, that was the most difficult. Like it, it took me half a year and 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 there were some partners that we went very far into discussions, almost got the letter of support, and I never did. So you know, like it, it can happen. Like you know, you, you need to explore a lot of options, and you need to think about what you want to do in the project as well. So it's not just okay. Let me find whoever. You know, Oxford University as a partner because it's Oxford University. It's like you need to think about who who is going to do what, how they will do it, how you will collaborate how they will train you how you will work with them yeah i highly highly agree that it, it is take it takes time and the key is to is to um have people looking at the ideas and proposal give you some comments and yeah. um yeah that that's a, the, the 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 formula to success um you, you mentioned this um um in your in your in your talk you mentioned this um you have been moving across different different countries yeah. um i want to ask um which one would this, select <laughs> this is the I question i know uh, i want i ask this harsh question <laughs> i want to ask do you see any difference yeah. research style yeah. across yeah. different countries yeah so I'll, I'll tell you and I, I, this is my personal experience probably people work in different labs get different experience so greece in greece I think we have some very good people that they work on the theory of the of of, of the science. So it, it's I think we have we have a very strong group in control theory, in um, you know game theory, like you know these topics, even computer vision. So things that they don't require hardware, I would say. Of course, not to offense any people that they do hardware in Greece. Uh, there are there are. But I think the strong point is like really the more the theoretical part of it. And when I was working in Greece, this is where I focused, like on the theoretical part of, of, of the science. 
so in my university, we didn't have a lab of robotics lab, for example, so which will excite me. I know that there are universities like the National Technical University of Athens that they have exceptional labs. Uh, so, you know, people might be more inspired in these labs, but not all, you know, not all labs in Greece have, have um, the equipment. The United States was really, the style was completely different. Uh, we were working full time. Like I, I didn't spend a single weekend outside the lab, basically. Uh, th the first time I visit, I really walked around Boston was a year after my graduation when I went and I was like, oh, that's a nice city, <laughs> actually. Because, you know, like the, the you know, th this was the, this is how PhD students were there, like constantly working. And, and this is, that was it, the environment. So it, it was an environment that was, you had to work from 9 a.m. where we were going until midnight. It's very hard working, yeah. Very hard working. I don't yeah. think this was efficient enough because then I went to Italy where people were not working until midnight, but they were working very efficiently. And I think I liked the system there a lot. Uh, and I try in my group at UCL to be something like that, like a little bit of balance between work and uh, life. This doesn't mean that if you have a deadline to just give up and you know say, oh, it's five o'clock, let, let's give up. But I'm saying that, yeah, of course, I expect, uh, I expect myself to work hard during a deadline, right? Because, you know, you, you need to wrap up and you know you, you have spent already six months on a project you really want to publish right you you really want to go somewhere or for for a conference uh, but what i'm saying is that you know i don't expect people to like stay overnight and i think that this i think this gives a nice you know balance between work and and life a phd time is a very i would say stressful time and very sometimes it can be depressive uh super stressful i mean you know especially in the thesis writing and the viva writing like that's the most stressful where where you where where you know there is an actual deadline that <laughs> you know after that there is not nothing else uh, and then you need to find your next job this is pretty stressful right uh, but i think if if you work nicely and smoothly um uh, th th this is it. So I think in the UK, I think I like the system. I think it's pretty close to what European countries are doing mm. uh, mostly. Uh, I've been also in India, in France. Uh, they were in very similar, very similar mm. uh, way. I, I think they, they produce a lot without this craziness of working until midnight in the lab uh, where, where we might see in the US, for example. Mm. Right. Thank you. Uh, I I think we we uh, oh I have I have a question here. We do. Uh, yeah. Uh, what do you think about the future direction of robotic learning research, mm -hmm. since the problems are often learned for specific task? Um, are the skills learned in one task can be used otherwise? How are the skills learned general generalizable? Right. That's a very good question. I mean. I wish I had the answer. I mean, you know, this is like a problem that uh, people really, really try to to deal with. Um, in terms of locomotion, it, it depends on the skills. So you have different skills. So we can talk about basic skills, which is walking, which is grasping. And I think there we have proven somehow in the community that this can be slightly generalizable right so nowadays i think if you try to do grasping you might reach very very high success rate just just to pick up objects right just to pick up toy objects the same with locomotion i mean you have seen uh, marco scooter um, uh, rl method or uh, using isaac sim uh, that it's able to deal with lots of different environments like water snow you know but this is a primitive skills, right? So this is, this is something that, you know, um, you know, they are the first stage. Then, then, then there are skills such as manipulation. So, you know, like, uh, can I use a hammer 
to and the nail correctly okay and what what if, what what if people choose a different hammer different nail different task okay that that's a good question i mean what we try at least is 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 one shot learning what we try is meta learning sometimes it is very promising um, although again i think they have some barriers and i wish to know i i, I wish i knew like the answer there was a recent um, idea but uh, by jan lekun that he explained about how brain robot brain or you know for computer vision problems should work and i i thought it's 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 interesting maybe people can can check this uh i'm not sure if it's gonna work but uh, it is interesting to see like what what basically he believes is that you know we 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 don't hold details of tasks we don't hold details of 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 you know skills we just hold a general model of what we want to do and then in a different level we hold details so it is like a hierarchical i believe network this is at least my understanding of what he shared so uh, you are right i mean this is an open problem and uh, we face this every day so you know i can tell you that forget about multi skill learning <laughs> forget about this let's let's say that i i, I train my franca emica panda arm to do some some task and then i want to go to a cook arm okay you know this is super difficult like i mean it doesn't work and i can tell you with leg robots is the same so we try for like three months to put the same code that work on a different robot in another robot and it doesn't work uh, it, it, because it has different sensory system different motors sometimes different kinematics and and even even like transfer from one one robot to another which are very similar like are six degrees of freedom manipulators they might not work then you change your camera <laughs> You know, you go from Intel real sense to another one and things break again. Like I never managed to I never managed to to run anything that uses a different camera than the one of the paper that I'm reading. And you know, there there are even worse uh, cases than just multi-skill learning, right? That that's 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 um that's that's the thing. So in terms of locomotion, I would say that you know the the I believe that you know there needs to be a primitive library somehow uh, stored um, uh, and be accessed very fast and 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 using this primitive library you you should be able to to have a way to combine it in order to to generate different motions based on different conditions i think this is the way that you can you can learn multi skill locomotion tasks um, i'm not very sure if one one policy could solve everything i mean there there is a research on you know using one policy to solve over everything but i'm not quite sure if this is the answer right thank you thank you i think it's already time so i have to call an end to this uh, webinar i would like to thank professor canalas again for giving this talk giving us a lot of first hand inside experience into um, the development of research in the RAS area. Thank you all, um, and I wish you a nice uh, evening. Okay, thank you.